Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. Timothy Burns, Tim to his friends, looked at his cell phone after leaving a message from Candace, or Candy, as she liked to be called, his wife of five years. He had just landed a service contract with a large company in California that had offices nationwide. He knew his boss, Jake Hudson, would be extremely pleased as the new contract meant a huge expansion in his IT firm. The new contract also meant a huge increase in his salary as well. Maybe now, he thought, he and Candy could finally start their family as they had planned. But he had concerns, concerns that began niggling in the back of his mind ever since he and his wife attended a camping trip with Jake a little more than a week ago. There was something a bit different about her when they returned from the trip. It seemed that her mind was on something else most of the time, and she had started getting just a bit snippy with him. But there was more. He noticed something else when they got home and had thrown their clothes in the hamper. A pair of her panties had something in the gusset. He picked them up and noticed that whatever it was had already hardened and had a very distinctive odor. Then it hit him, and he felt as if his whole world had collapsed. He had no idea whose fluid was in her panties, though, but he swore to find out the truth. He knew he had a trip coming up to the West Coast, so he visited an attorney to find out what options he had. If Candy was cheating, he thought, that would be the end of their marriage. Are you sure that your wife is cheating? Ruby Hawkins asked. Ruby was an attorney who specialized in family law and divorce and was recommended to him by a friend who had just divorced his wife for cheating. Not 100%, he said. But I need to know, and if she is, I want a divorce. Well, Ruby said, most divorces in this state are no fault. You can file on the grounds of adultery, but you'll need to have ironclad proof. You mean, like photos or a video? Tim asked. Yes, Ruby said. If you like, I can have an investigator keep tabs on her and find out for certain. Yes, please, Tim said. What can I expect in a divorce? Well, since she makes about as much as you do with her teaching job, there's a chance we can keep you from having to pay her any alimony, Ruby said. You don't have any real estate, and you don't have any children, so basically, everything will be split 50 to 50. You keep your retirement, and she keep hers. Basically, it's an even split of the assets. If she is cheating on you, we'll use that as the grounds and use whatever evidence we have to ensure a good outcome. I'll start putting the paperwork together and we'll go when we have the evidence. Okay, Tim said. Go ahead and do it. I'll be out of town for about three days, so I imagine that's when she'll probably do it. She called in her investigator, Marvin Johnson, and he suggested Tim place a tracking app on her phone. He also gave Tim a device to record phone calls on his landline and an audio recorder he would stash in her purse. Tim hated doing this, but he had to know the truth. There were other clues as well. Ever since the camping trip, Jake seemed even more arrogant and condescending than before. It was almost as if he knew something Tim didn't. He managed to get through the week and Candy drove him to the airport, giving him a kiss as he left. I'll call you tonight after dinner, he said. Okay, dear, she told him. Have a safe flight. The first night he was gone, he called Candy as promised and was a bit shocked when she told him she would be working as a waitress for a party Jake was holding at his house that evening. According to Candy, one of the original waitresses had gotten sick, and Jake asked if she would fill in. He wasn't aware that Jake had anything planned, as he hadn't mentioned anything. He promised to pay me $150 for the evening, Candy said. I could use the extra money since I don't start back to work for a couple weeks. He knew that classes were starting back up soon and she really could use the extra money. But something seemed a bit off about this. Really? Tim asked. Okay, go ahead, but be careful and tell me about it tomorrow, okay? Okay, she said. You know I love you, right? Yeah, he said. And I love you too. Good night. He ended the call, but a knot was starting to form in his gut. He called the investigator. I just wanted to let you know that Candy's been asked to work as a waitress for a party at Jake Hudson's house, Tim said. Okay. Marvin said. We've got it. I'll forward whatever we find out to you. Thanks, Tim said, ending the call. The next day, he called Candy's cell, but got no answer. He also called the house phone, but only got the answering machine. Surely, she didn't spend the night with Jake, he thought to himself. His hopes were dashed, however, when he got the email from Marvin that afternoon. Candy spent the night at Hudson's house and she's still there, the email said. And she was quite busy the night before. I've attached a couple of photos, but I want to warn you, they're pretty graphic. I'll give you my full report when you return. Tim opened the attachments and his heart sank. There was his lovely wife of five years, all her holes filled. One was attached to Jake, while the other two belonged to colleagues from the office, 
men he once considered friends. The second picture showed her sprawled on the floor. His hands began shaking as tears fell from his eyes. He couldn't believe what he had just witnessed. He tried calling her phone one more time, but it went straight to voicemail. He also tried calling the house phone, but only got the answering machine. He left no message and went to the bar in the hotel to drown his sorrows. The next morning, he checked the tracker and found that Candy's phone was still at Jake's house, which meant she was probably still there. Marvin verified that assumption with an email that contained two more photos of his wife engaging in a gangbang with multiple men, including Jake, his son Mike, and others who worked at Jake's IT firm. He had once considered all these men to be trusted colleagues, but no longer. He didn't recognize the other three and figured they were friends of Mike's. He concluded his business with the California client and, contract in hand, checked out of the hotel and grabbed an early flight home. He grabbed a taxi at the airport and noticed that Candy's car was gone when he arrived home. Checking the tracker, he saw that her phone was still at Jake's house. He went inside, changed clothes, and called Ruby's office. He was surprised when her receptionist said she was available and could see him that afternoon. He called Candy's cell and was surprised when she answered. She seemed out of breath when she answered. Hello, she asked. Hey, it's me, Tim, he said. Where are you? I'm at home, just catching up on a few things before classes start, she said. He was shocked that she would lie so blatantly to him. I see, he said. Well, I'm done here in California and I'm on my way home. Oh good, she said. I've missed you so much. Call me when you land and I'll come pick you up at the airport. No, don't bother, he said. I'll grab a taxi or something. Bye. He ended the call and wondered if she noticed that he didn't tell her he loved her or would see her later. Shaking his head, he left the house and went to see Ruby. Candy looked at the phone after Tim ended the call. He always ended his calls by telling her he loved her, but he didn't this time. In fact, she noticed that he didn't sound very friendly at all. She had every intention of going home after that first night, but being sandwiched naked between Jake and his son felt so good to her that she just couldn't leave. After all, she owed this to herself, she thought. It would all end when classes started back up, she thought. And Tim would never know. So, she spent the next day and the next night with Jake and his son, Mike. Jake went to work that second day for a couple hours, but Mike kept her busy and even arranged for several of his friends to come by later for a gangbang. When Jake came back home, she was riding Mike on Jake's bed. Jake came over to join the action. After they finished, Jake sat down and looked at her. So maybe I should send your husband out more often, he said with a wicked smile. You do know I have classes starting back up soon, she said. So, I won't be available during the week. I don't dare do anything like this while he's still home. Why not? Jake asked. Maybe he'd get off on seeing you get drilled by some real men for a change. Jake and Mike both laughed at that. Well, I have to admit, I have gotten hooked on you, she said. But I still love Tim, and I don't want to hurt him. Well... Maybe I can make sure that he gets sent out over the weekend, Jake said. That way you can come over and play house with us. That sounds like fun, she said. But he's going to find out at some point. Tim's not stupid, you know. Don't worry, Jake said, picking up his camera. I'll take care of Timmy boy. There's just one thing. What's that? She asked. I don't want you to have sex with him anymore, Jake said. You belong to us now. Got it. But how will I do that? She asked. You'll figure something out, Jake said. Make up some excuse. You know, like, I have a headache, or something. Okay, I'll try, she said. None of them ever took notice of the service van parked across the street from Jake's house, and none of them noticed the mini cams attached to the windows that recorded all of her antics. Tim was a wreck when he saw all the evidence Marvin had gathered. In addition to photos, he had two SD cards full of video starring his wife performing multiple acts with multiple men, things she would never do for him. His love for her had burned away after watching her debauchery. Ruby comforted him as best she could, but it was a lost cause. After five years, how could she just turn into such a slut, he wondered. And what did I ever do to deserve this? And what about Jake? He had considered the somewhat older man to be a friend. Now, he knew better. I'll go ahead and draw up the papers for divorce, citing adultery, Ruby said. If you want, I can also file for alienation of affection against Jake and the men you work with. Those lawsuits usually don't go very far but I think we can get a good settlement. Do what you have to do, Tim said. Just don't do anything stupid, Ruby said. I don't want to have to bail you out of jail. Tim shook his head. Don't worry, he said. I won't. When can you have the papers ready? I can have everything ready to go in just a couple days, she said. In the meantime, try to act normal around your wife. 
I'm not that good of an actor, Tim told her. And there's no way I'm touching her ever again. God only knows what she's gotten from all those men. Tell her you're not feeling too well, Ruby suggested. That should buy you a little time. Tim nodded his head. Yeah, okay, he said before he left. Sitting in his car, he suddenly realized something else. There was no way he could work for Jake anymore. And there was no way he could tolerate being around the men who had cuckled at him. He pulled out his phone and looked through his contacts until he found the number he was looking for. He hit the number and hoped for the best. Carlson, the man at other end said when he answered. John, this is Tim Burns, Tim said. Tim, how are you, old friend? John asked. Could be better, Tim said. Listen, is that position with Empire still open? John Carlson, an executive with Empire, had been trying for some time to get Tim on board, but Tim felt he needed to stay with Jake out of a sense of loyalty to him. That loyalty, however, was now gone. Of course, it is, John said. You finally decided to come join an established company? Yeah, something like that, Tim said. Some things have come to my attention and I find I can no longer work there. I'm sorry to hear that, John said. Is there anything I can do? Just give me a job, Tim said. I promise I'll work as hard for you as I did for Jake. Of course, John said. Would Monday be okay to start? Absolutely, Tim said. Good, John said. Listen, why don't you and that pretty wife of yours come by tonight and have some of Rose's famous lasagna? We can catch up and I'll go over the compensation package with you. I'd love to, but unfortunately, I can't bring candy, Tim said. Oh, John asked. What happened? I really don't want to get into it on the phone, Tim said. I can get into it a bit tonight if you want. Sure, Tim, John said, sounding concerned. You know, Rose is a licensed counselor. Maybe she can help you if you want. That actually sounds good, John. I appreciate it, Tim said. Good, John said. I'll call Rose and let her know. Think you can come by at, say, 6.30 tonight? Sure, Tim said. 6.30 it is. Thanks again, buddy. My pleasure, John said. They ended the call and Tim felt as though a giant weight had been lifted off his back. He started his car and headed home. When he got there, he noticed that Candy still hadn't made it back from Jake's house. He grabbed his briefcase and went inside. He showered, changed clothes and sat at his computer, where he wrote his resignation letter. Candy finally came in about 5 p.m. and noticed her husband sitting at his computer. She went to give him a kiss, but he turned his head and she ended up kissing his cheek. Surprised, she looked at him before speaking. Is everything all right? She asked. Not really, he said. I'm not feeling too well. Maybe it's jet lag or something. I don't know. I'll sleep on the futon when I get back tonight. Get back. She asked. Where are you going? I'm meeting someone for dinner, he said. Are you meeting a woman? She asked, concern in her voice. You mean, am I cheating on you? He asked her. No. I've never cheated on you in all the time we've been together, and I have no intention of doing so now. Can you say the same? She recoiled in horror. Does he know? She asked herself. No, there's no way he could ever know. Of course, I can't, she said. Tim wasn't convinced. So, how was your trip to California? She asked, trying to change the subject. Successful, he said. And how was your little job at Jake's house? It went well, she said. Even when it was hard, it was still fun. I'll bet he said with no emotion in his voice. He looked at his watch before speaking again. I'd better get going, he told her before saving his work and shutting down his computer. He stood and walked past her without a word and went into the master bedroom, where he changed into something a bit less casual. When he came out, Candy was sitting on the couch. How long will you be gone, she asked. I don't know, he said. Don't wait up for me. Bye. He grabbed his keys and headed out the door. She couldn't help but notice that he didn't kiss her and tell her he loved her. He always did that when he left the house. After she saw his car leave, she picked up the house phone and called Jake, unaware that her conversation was being recorded. Jake, I think he knows something, she said. What makes you think that? Jake asked. He wouldn't touch me at all, she said. He usually always gives me a kiss and tells me he loves me, but he didn't. He seemed so cold. And he just left, saying he had a dinner appointment. Oh. Jake asked, did he say with whom? No, he didn't, she said. Jake, what if he knows? What if he's planning to leave me? So, what if he does? Jake sneered. You can always come stay with us. And don't worry about Timmy boy. I'll keep him running around so much he'll hardly ever be home. But I don't want to lose him, Candy cried. I love him. Jake laughed out loud. Yeah, you showed us all how much you love him these past two days or so, didn't you? Jake asked. 
That's not funny, Jake, she said. I know what I did with you guys and yeah, I enjoyed it, but I still love him. I don't want to lose him. Yeah, right, Jake said. Look, let him get it out of his system. After a while, he'll come on board. And if he doesn't, well, we can do something about that as well. You're not going to hurt him, are you? She asked. Not in so many words, Jake said. We'll just have to show him the way things are going to be from now on. And you're going to help make it happen. What? Candy asked, shocked. That's right, Jake said. When the time comes, you're going to help us explain things to him. Remember who you belong to now. I'm sure you wouldn't want the school board to see those videos we have of you. You wouldn't dare, Candy said. Oh, yes, but I would, Jake said. I've got videos of you at the camping trip and lots of videos of you in some very compromising positions. You literally belong to me. So, it's up to you to keep Timmy Boy in line. Feeling trapped, Candy gave in. Okay, Jake, she said. But don't hurt him. Jake sneered over the phone. Yeah, yeah, whatever, he said, ending the call. Tim pulled up to the large two-story home where John and Rose Carlson lived. He got out of his car, grabbing the bottle of wine he picked up on the way over. John answered the door when he rang the bell and graciously accepted the wine. Come on in, Tim, he said with a smile. And thanks. It'll get put to good use tonight. John led Tim into the dining room, where Rose was waiting with her lasagna. Tim, please meet my wife, Rose, John said. Rose, this is Tim Burns, our new account representative. Tim shook Rose's hand as John opened the bottle of wine. Good to meet you, Tim, Rose said with a smile. A pleasure to meet you as well, Mrs. Carlson, Tim said. Please, call me Rose, she said. Mrs. Carlson sounds so formal. They took their seat at the table and Rose dished out a helping of lasagna as John poured the wine. Tim had never tasted lasagna this good and offered his thanks. This is the best lasagna I've ever eaten, he said. I'm glad you like it, Rose said. It's one of my specialties. So, Tim, I don't mean to pry, but I'm curious why you decided to leave Jake so fast, John said. Did something happen? Tim nodded his head before he began. Yeah, something happened all right, Tim said. Please, Tim, tell us about it. Rose said. Tim gathered his thoughts for a moment before giving them the story. Damn, John said. That's cold. I feel for you. Really? I had something similar happen to me, but the circumstances were quite different. So what are you going to do now besides change jobs? I've seen an attorney and I'm filing for divorce, Tim said. My lawyer says it'll pretty much be an even split. What about counseling? Rose asked. Have you considered that? It's too far gone, Tim said. I don't know what got into candy. It's like she just flipped a switch and became a slut all of a sudden. I never knew she had it in her to be like this. How are you handling all of this? Rose asked. Not too well, Tim said. My lawyer says I should try to act normal around Candy, but I'm finding it very hard to do that. Right now, I can't even stand to look at her. Maybe you should consider counseling, she said. I may do that, Tim said. Trust me, Rose is the best in the business, John said. I think she can help you get through this if you want. Besides, it's covered in your benefit package. That's certainly a plus, Tim said, laughing. I'm serious, John said. Rose was a godsend when I needed her. I know she can help you as well. He turned to Rose. Do you think you can fit him in your schedule? Of course, she said. I think an hour a week should work. What about it, Tim? Tim thought about the offer before answering. Okay, I'll do it, he said. John smiled and patted Tim on the shoulder. Good man, he said. I'll make sure you get the time you need for counseling. Work it out with Rose and let me know what you come up with. I will. Thanks, Tim said. And now, if you don't mind, dear, Tim and I will retreat to my office so we can discuss his new job, John said. I don't mind at all, she said with a smile. And I'm looking forward to working with you as well, Tim. Thank you, Tim said as he stood with John. They retreated to John's home office where he poured them each a sniffer of brandy. They spent the next two hours discussing his new job. By the time they were done, Tim felt as if he was taking control of his life again. Tim shook John's hand and headed back home. It was about 10 p.m. when Tim pulled into his driveway. He looked and saw the lights were still on in his apartment. He hoped Candy was there by herself. He got out of his car and went into his apartment and saw Candy sitting on the couch. So, how did your little meeting go? She asked. Very well, thank you, he said. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to bed. Good night. He went into the second bedroom where his computer was and began to get undressed. Are you sleeping in here now? Candy asked from the door. Yes, Tim said. I'm still not feeling too good, so I'll sleep on the futon. Is that a problem? Oh, uh, no, I guess not, she said. 
It's just that you've been gone for three days and I was hoping we could, you know, play around a little bit. I'm not up to it tonight, Tim said. In reality, the thought of touching her right now made him squeamish. Okay, she said quietly. Maybe tomorrow? I don't know, he said. We'll see. She nodded her head and turned away. She couldn't help but wonder what, if anything, he knew about her activities lately. The next day, he got up before Candy, grabbed his resignation letter, and poured a cup of coffee. He saw Candy's purse on the kitchen counter and grabbed the audio recorder, then downloaded the audio from the previous day's phone call. He left the apartment without saying goodbye or telling Candy that he loved her. She heard the door close when he left and lay in bed, tears falling down her cheeks. When he got to the office, he barely spoke to anyone. He said hello to his secretary, then went into his office and closed the door. He was packing his things when Jake came into his office. What's this? Jake asked. Tim reached into his briefcase and pulled out two envelopes. One is the signed contract from California, he said. And the other is my resignation, effective immediately. I believe you owe me a bonus for getting the California account and you owe me my final pay with the balance of my vacation time. Resignation? Jake asked, shocked. What the EFF? Why are you leaving? I need you. Seriously? Tim asked. You honestly don't know why? You think I'm stupid or something? I'm not, you know. Frankly, some things have come to my attention and I've decided that I can no longer work here. I've accepted a position with another firm. I'll be out of your hair in just a few minutes. Then I'm going to HR. Wait, Tim, can't we talk about this? Jake asked. Tim shook his head. There's nothing to talk about, Jake, Tim said. I'm done. Finished. I considered you my friend, but you stabbed me in the back and destroyed my marriage. You can find someone else to cuckold. So that's what this is all about, Jake said. Well, just so you know, your wife was more than willing to have sex with me. We don't need to let something like that ruin your career. Just go with the flow for a while. Let Candy sow a few wild oats for a while. When she's done, she'll be all yours again. God, you are a slimy piece of shit, aren't you? Tim asked. You honestly think I'd go along with something like that? How long have you been screwing her, by the way? Well, the first time was at the camp out, Jake said. On the second day while you and the others were out skiing. And you should know she came on to me that day, right there in your tent. She even told me I'm bigger than you. Then she begged me to drill her, right there. And that's about the time you suddenly had me leave to take care of something at the office, isn't it? Tim asked. You wanted me out of the way so you could do my wife. Jake smirked as he nodded his head. Yeah, so what, he asked. Tim wasn't finished. And that whole thing about hiring her to be a waitress at your party was just another excuse to get her into bed, wasn't it? Tim asked. Yeah, it was. So what? Jake asked. Tim pulled out his phone and stopped the audio recording he started when Jake walked in the office. Thank you for your admission, Tim said. Now, if you don't mind, I'm done packing. I'll go to HR and I'll be out of your hair. Wait, Jake said. You can't use that recording. We'll see, Tim said. I'm out of here. Goodbye, Jake. Rot in hell? Okay. You forgot something, Jake said, picking up a photo of candy that Tim kept on his desk. I didn't forget, Tim said. I don't want it. You and your son want the skank so much. You can have the skank. I'm done with her. And you. Goodbye. With that, he left the office. Jake looked at Tim as he left, wondering what the hell just happened. How did Tim find out about what he and his son had done with Candy, he asked himself. What do you mean? He resigned. Candy asked when Jake called. He just handed me a signed contract and a resignation letter and left, Jake said. He knows, Candy. I don't know how he knows, but he knows. What did you tell him? She asked. The truth, Jake said. I told him about the first time on the camping trip. You idiot, she exclaimed. Well, he asked, so I told him, Jake said. He also left the picture he kept of you on his desk. Said he didn't want it. Terrific, she said, tears falling down her cheek. So, what do we do now, she asked. Not my problem, Jake said. He's your husband. You deal with it. Unless, of course, you want me to come over and make him see the error of his ways. No, she said. You've done enough. Thank you. Stay out of this. I'll deal with it. Whatever, he said. With that, he hung up. Candy looked at her phone, tears falling down her face. She didn't want a divorce, but she knew Tim wouldn't stand for her cheating. She decided she would do everything she could to hang on to him. She sat on the couch, her head in her hands, sobbing over what she had done. A few minutes later, Tim pulled into the driveway. He saw Candy's car and looked to see if Jake's car was anywhere around. Not seeing it, he grabbed his box and briefcase and went inside. 
He saw Candy on the couch and saying nothing, went into his office. He closed and locked the door, then checked for any voice recordings. He found the recording and listened to the call between Candy and Jake. He forwarded it to his lawyer, then gave her a quick call. Hello, Tim, she said. I just got your latest email. I'm in the process of filing your paperwork now. Good, Tim said. When can they be served? If you want, I can pull some strings and have my process server deliver them late this afternoon, she said. Will that work? It will. Thanks, he said. After hanging up, he went to his gun safe, opened it, and pulled out his old .45 caliber semi-automatic pistol. He had no plans on using it, but he didn't want any problems with Jake or Candy. He made his way into the kitchen, set his briefcase on the table, and looked at Candy. We need to talk, he said, setting the pistol on the table so he could get to it quickly if he had to. Is that really necessary? She asked, pointing at the gun. I hope not, he said. I just want to make sure, just in case your lover decided to come barging in. My lover, she asked. Don't play coy with me, bitch, he said. I'm in no mood for your games. Now sit down. We have a few things to discuss. She sat down, scared, not knowing what her husband was planning to do. First things first, Tim said. Later today, someone is going to come by and serve you with papers. Divorce papers. Candy recoiled in shock. Divorce? She asked. Why? I don't want a divorce. I love you. Bullshit, Tim said. I know all about you and Jake and his son and all the others you've been fucking these last few days. So, I filed for divorce on the grounds of adultery. Adultery? She asked. You don't have any proof of that. Tim smiled as he pulled out an envelope. He dropped a few time-stamped photos, all of which clearly showed her having sex with multiple men, including Jake. I also have video and audio, Tim said. Would you like to watch? She shook her head knowing it was a lost cause. Good, he said. Considering the circumstances, I've been more than fair. No support. You get half of what's in the bank. We each keep our retirement, and you can have all your stuff. I've already paid off and canceled your credit card. I have a cashier's check for your half of what's left. There's also a restraining order that says you have to remain at least 500 feet away from me, my residence, and my place of work. So you have from now until you're served to pack your trash. You're kicking me out? She asked tears falling down her cheeks. That's pretty much the size of it, he said. But what if I decide to fight the divorce, she asked. Tim laughed. I don't think that would be very wise, he said. What do you think the school board would say if some of these photos and videos just happened to appear? Do you think the parents of your students would want someone like you teaching their kids? I know I wouldn't. You wouldn't dare, she exclaimed. You want to take that chance? Tim asked. Candy looked down for a moment before shaking her head. No, she said. I don't. I'll need that job. That's right, you will, Tim said. There's a couple other things you should know. What? She asked, dejected. You'll be required to surrender your rings and give up my surname, he said. My God, you have become a heartless bastard, haven't you? She asked, pulling her rings off. Yeah, well, you gave me good reason, Tim said. I just want to know one thing. What happened? What made you go from being a loving, faithful wife to a walking toy for anything with a dick? She looked down before speaking. It happened the second day of the camping trip, she said. You were out on the boat and I was in the tent. Jake came by and saw me. I had taken off my clothes and was laying there trying to rest when Jake came by and walked into the tent. He seemed embarrassed at first, seeing me naked like that. We started talking and then he pulled his pants down and that was it. So, some a holy with a bigger one that mine drops his pants and you're on it like white on rice, Tim said. And that's all it took for you to become a cheating 304. How many times did you fuck him on that trip? Twice, she said. The first time when you were out water skiing, and the second time when Jake sent you back to the office. Tim shook his head and pointed at the photos. I see that none of your lovers used any protection, he said. Weren't you worried about getting pregnant, or getting something from one of them? I'm still on the pill, she said. That doesn't mean you can't get pregnant, Tim said. And you can still get a disease. Is that what you were planning? Oh God, no, she said. Tim shook his head. You know, in all the time we've been together, I've been hit on a lot, by women who look like goddesses compared to you, he said. I turned them all down. You know why? Because I thought I had a loving and faithful wife at home, and I would never do anything to hurt her. But you, you didn't even think about what you were doing. You didn't give a damn about what I would feel. All you wanted was a big dick. Or tin. I hope it was all worth it to you. Now, get your shit packed. I expect you to leave when you're served. Tim, please? She began. Can't we get some counseling? Please? I'll never do it again, I promise. Can't you forgive me this time? 
I will never forgive you for what you've done, Tim said, his expression harder than she had ever seen before. From the moment Jake dropped his trousers, you were his willing 304. And I can never forgive that level of betrayal. But don't you love me enough to get past this? She asked. He shook his head. No. Right now, I can't stand the sight of you, he said. The sooner you're out of my life, the better. Now go. Start packing. Whatever you leave behind will either get burned, thrown out, or given to goodwill. Sobbing, she stood up and went into the master bedroom to pack. Tim watched as Candy brought out one full trash bag after another. She stopped once and looked at him. Can you at least help me get this in my car? She asked. Nope, Tim said. You're trash. You deal with it. And remember, whatever you leave behind will either get burned or tossed. That includes pictures and your wedding dress. You'd burn my wedding dress? She asked. My parents paid thousands for that dress. Well, then you'd better take it if you don't want it burned, Tim said. Sobbing, she carried the bag out to her car and came back for another. Damn, Tim asked himself. How much shit does she have? A couple hours later, she sat down at the bail, exhausted. I can't fit anything else in the car, she said. Can I come back later for the rest of it? Please. No, Tim said. You won't be allowed within 500 feet of the place. Ask your parents if they'll come by for it if you want. I'll hold off throwing anything out for a few days. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate that, she said. Oh my God, I just thought, what will I tell my parents? Try the truth for a change, Tim said. Tell them you cheated on me with my boss and others and I kicked you out. Seriously, she asked. They'll disown me if I do that. Not my problem, Tim said. But I guarantee you it'll be a lot worse if you try to make me out to be the bad guy or sugarcoat it with them. You know how your parents feel about lying. About that time, there was a knock at the door. I think that'll be for you, Tim said. Candy went to the door slowly and opened it to find a sheriff's deputy. Candace Burns, he asked. She nodded her head. That's me, she said. Do you have some ID? He asked. She pulled out her driver's license and showed it to him. After he inspected it, he handed it back to her then handed her an envelope. You've been served, ma'am, he said. There's also a restraining order that requires you to vacate the premises immediately. You can sign the divorce papers now if you wish. She nodded her head and pulled out the divorce paperwork. After looking it over, she asked for a pin and signed the papers. I'll get this back to the attorney, he said. You'll need to leave now. If you try to come back, you'll be arrested and put in jail. Do you understand? Yes, she said, tears falling down her cheeks. She looked back at Tim. I'm so sorry, she said. Yeah, me too, Tim said. Bye. Goodbye, she said quietly as she left. The deputy looked at Tim and nodded his head before he left. The next few days were hectic for Tim. Candy never tried contacting him, but Jake called the house phone twice and left threatening messages. God damn it, Tim. I know you're there, he screamed. If you don't drop this lawsuit, I'm going to come and kick your fucking ass. Tim smiled, copied the voicemail and forwarded it to Ruby, who in turn notified the local sheriff's department. Candy's parents also called, wondering if they could come by to get more of her things. Yeah, sure, Tim said. Just make sure she's not with you. There's a restraining order on her. Okay. George, Candy's father said with a sigh. When he and Candy's mother, Bernice, came by, they grabbed what Candy had left behind and used the time to encourage Tim to drop the divorce. Tim, she made a mistake, Bernice said. Surely you can get past what she did and take her back. She's crazy about you. What did she tell you, Bernice? Tim asked. She said she screwed up with your boss, Bernice said. And that's it, Tim asked. Well, yeah, she said. She didn't get into any specifics and we didn't press it. Tim grabbed the envelope with the pictures and SD cards and showed the photos to Bernice and George. They were shocked when they saw the photos. I'm sorry she didn't tell you the whole truth, Tim said. As you can see, it was a lot worse than she made on. Oh my God, Bernice said. I had no idea it was this bad. I'm so sorry, Tim, she said. I don't blame you for what you did. George's face was red with rage. I'm going to have a long talk with that stupid daughter of ours, he said. Have you done anything else with these photos? He asked. Tim shook his head. Not yet, but I warned her not to fight the divorce, he said. They commiserated with him for a bit, then finished packing up the rest of her things. A half hour later, they left the apartment, giving Tim a hearty hug and wishing him well. Later that day, as Tim sat watching television, there was another knock on the door. He looked through the peephole and saw Jake, Mike and two of Tim's former work colleagues. He went into his office and grabbed his pistol from the gun case and called 911. Holding the gun behind his back, 
He barely got the door open before they barged in. We're gonna kick your fucking ass, Jake growled. Tim pulled his pistol and held it on Jake, causing them to pause. You're not really gonna shoot us, Jake said. You don't have the balls. You really wanna put that to the test? Tim asked. Just so you know, I've already called 911 and police are on their way over here right now. If you're here when they get here, you're going to jail for violating the restraining order. Uh, Jake, I think he means it, one of the other two men said. Jake looked at him for a moment then turned back to Tim. Just then, they all heard a siren nearby and saw the flashing red and blue lights. Yeah, Jake, I mean it, Tim said. They turned to leave but two very large uniformed police officers were at the door. Tim lowered his pistol. Put the gun down, sir, one of the officers said. Tim obeyed, putting the pistol on the kitchen counter. Sir, these men are violating a restraining order, Tim said. They barged into my apartment and threatened me. I want them arrested. Do you have a copy of the order? The other policeman asked. Tim nodded his head. I do, officer, Tim said. He pulled an envelope sitting on the kitchen counter and handed it to the officer, who examined the order carefully. After a few moments, he handed the order back to Tim, then turned to the four men. Turn around, hands behind your back, the officer said. The four men glared at Tim as the officers cuffed them and read them their rights. Once they were cuffed, one of the officers turned to Tim. Do you have a license for that firearm? He asked. Yes, I do, Tim said. Would you like to see it? He pulled out his wallet and showed the officer the license card and his NRA firearms training card. The officer nodded his head after examining the cards. All right, he said. You be careful with that thing? You hear me? I hear you, officer, Tim said. Thanks. The next three months were a blur for Tim. He enjoyed working at Empire, much more than he ever did working for Jake. His weekly counseling with Rose also helped him deal with his trust and anger issues. At the same time, he joined a gym and worked out three days a week. In addition, he began taking classes in martial arts, more for the mental discipline than anything else. On top of that, he took a course in diet and exercise that Rose recommended to him. The divorce went through the system with ease, especially since Candy didn't contest it. The alienation of affection lawsuits, however, were somewhat different. Ruby had warned that they might end up dismissed, and two of them were. The case against Jake, however, surprised both Tim and Ruby. After listening to testimony, reviewing the evidence Ruby put forward and reviewing Jake's financial disclosures, the judge summarily found in Tim's favor and ordered Jake to pay $1 million in restitution. He had no kind words for Jake at the end of the trial. Mr. Hudson, your behavior in this matter is beyond reprehensible, the judge said. Not only did you take advantage of a man who considered you a friend, you abused your position as his employer in order to deliberately destroy his marriage and his family. I also noticed that you defied the restraining order against you on more than one occasion. Therefore, I find in favor of the plaintiff and order you to pay restitution in the amount of $1 million. Your Honor, this is highly irregular, Jake's lawyer said, standing up. Mr. Winthrop, this court finds Mr. Hudson's behavior not only irregular, but absolutely despicable. The order stands, the judge said. When is this restitution due? Winthrop asked. Immediately, the judge said. Unless, of course, your client would rather spend some time in jail for contempt. No, your honor, my client will pay as ordered, Winthrop said, sitting back down. Good, the judge said. And may God help you if this check bounces. Case closed. He banged a gavel, ending the hearing. Jake wrote a check and passed it to his attorney, who handed it to the bailiff. After the judge made note of the check, the bailiff handed it to Ruby, who, in turn, gave it to Tim. To Tim's surprise, the check actually cleared the bank, and he paid Ruby her share of the judgment. While working at Empire, Tim was contacted by several of Jake's clients. It seemed that word of the lawsuit had gotten around, and a number of businesses were leery of doing any further business with someone who deliberately set out to ruin another man's marriage. In their view, a man who would deliberately destroy a friend's marriage simply couldn't be trusted. At the rate things were going, Tim figured that Jake would be out of business within a year. Throughout this time, Tim refused to date, even though he had been approached by several very nice women in the company. In his mind, he would be a married man until he got his final decree. Once that happened, then he would be free to pursue a relationship, but not before. When the final decree finally arrived, he went out to celebrate with some friends from work. Part of that celebration included a lap dance from a very well-endowed stripper. A couple months after he got the final decree, he received a phone call from Candy's mother. Tim, this is Bernice. Do you have a few minutes? She asked. Sure, Bernice, he said. 
What's going on? It's Candy, she said. She's HIV positive. She just got the test results. I'm sorry to hear that, Bernice, Tim said. But to be honest with you, I'm not surprised. Besides, we're officially divorced now, so there's nothing I can do. She's not on my insurance and I'm not responsible for her. I know, Bernice said. I was just hoping that maybe you can see it in your heart to talk to her for a little bit. Well, I guess I can, but I don't know what good it'll do, he said. Please, just come over and talk to her for a few minutes, Bernice begged. Tim thought for a minute before responding. All right, he said. I'll come over for a few minutes. Thank you so much, Bernice said. Tim drove to Bernice and George's house and was shocked to see how thin and frail Candy looked. She started coming toward him, but he waved her off. Saddened, she sat down and invited him to sit on the couch. You're looking good, Tim, she said. Better than I remember. How are things going with you? Good, Candy, he said. New job, new friends, a new outlook on life. How are you doing? Not well at all, she said. You know that I'm HIV positive. That's what your mother said, he told her. I'm sorry to hear that, but frankly, I'm not surprised. Do you know when you got infected? I think it was one of the days I spent at Jake's, she said. I had a lot of unprotected sex with several men that day. Does Jake know? He asked. She shook her head. Not yet, she said. I'll have to tell him so he can get tested as well. I'm sure he's not going to take it well, Tim said. No, probably not, she said. Listen, Tim, I just wanted to apologize to you one last time, and I was hoping maybe you could see it in your heart to forgive me for what I did to you. I realize now my actions have destroyed a lot of lives. I could have said no at any time, but I didn't. I was stupid and greedy, and I let my hormones overrule my rational mind. And now, I'm paying the price. I had the best husband and lover a girl could ever want, and I threw it all away for a big dick. I know you hate me and you have every right to, but I don't want to go to my grave without your forgiveness. Tim considered her words carefully. This was the first time he could recall that she actually took responsibility for what she had done, and the first time that she acknowledged what her actions had done to others. Sure, he could continue hating her, but he recalled his sessions with Rose. Holding a grudge against Candy wouldn't help him move on. He nodded his head. All right, Candy, he said. I forgive you. She began crying as she sat in the chair. He thought about taking her in his arms and began to stand up, but she waved him off. Thank you so much, Tim, she said through her tears. That means more to me than you know. Listen, I want you to find a woman you can love and trust, marry her and have children with her. I'm done. I'm finished, but you have your whole life ahead of you, and you deserve to be happy. Thank you, he said. I'll do that. And if you ever want to just talk, let me know, okay? She nodded her head as she wiped the tears from her eyes. I will, Tim, she said. Thank you for coming over and talking with me. I've missed you so much these last few months. I've missed the woman I married, Tim said calmly. How are things with Jake and Mike, by the way? She shook her head. Not good, she said. He's gotten very abusive lately. He didn't take losing to you in court very well. You probably know his business has taken quite a hit lately. I've noticed, Tim said. Has he hurt you? Physically. Not yet. But he's very abrupt, she said. Do you want me to be with you when you tell him about your diagnosis? Tim asked. No, but thanks for asking anyway, she said. This is my responsibility and I need to handle it. You know, I keep thinking that if I had just told him to leave that first day at the camping trip, we'd still be together. That's quite possible, Tim said. But I have a feeling it would have happened at some point anyway. He'd been after you for quite a while. I think you're right, she said. Listen, I'm getting really tired and I need to rest before I go back. Thank you for coming over. It really does mean more to me than you know. You're welcome, Candy, he said. And remember, call me if you just want to talk or something, okay? She nodded her head weakly. I will, she said. Goodbye, Tim, she added. Think of me every once in a while, okay? He detected a bit of finality in her last statement and wondered if she intended to commit suicide. I will, he said. Just don't do anything stupid, okay? She smiled. I won't, she said. He stood and walked to the door. Bernice came over to him before he walked out. Thank you, Tim, she said, giving him a hug. This means more to her than you know. And to me as well. You're welcome, Bernice, he said. Keep an eye on her. Okay? I will, she said. A couple weeks later, Tim was sitting on his couch, eating dinner and watching the evening news when he heard a report that caught his attention. The bodies of a local businessman, his son and a woman believed to be the man's lover were found earlier today in what police believe was a double murder and suicide, the anchors said. 
Jacob Hudson, president and founder of Hudson Consulting, along with his son and a woman whose identity has yet to be released, were found dead. According to authorities, all three were the victims of gunshot wounds. Police are investigating the incident and more details will be provided as they are released. After recovering from his initial shock, Tim called Bernice. She was sobbing when she answered the phone. Bernice, what's going on? He asked. We just got informed that Candy is dead, she said. It looks like that bastard Jake shot her, then his own son and himself. Oh my God, Tim said. I saw a report on the news and I was hoping it wasn't her. I'm so sorry. It's her, Bernice said. Did the police have any idea why it happened? Tim asked. They're not 100% certain, she said. But I'm pretty sure she told Jake about her HIV and he lost it. They're doing autopsies on them now. I'm really sorry, Bernice, Tim said. I want you to know I never wanted this to happen. I know, Tim, she said. Candy made her own bed and paid the price. Still, it's hard to lose an only child like that. I'm just glad you were able to make peace with her. I like to think she's in a better place right now. Well, let me know if there's anything I can do, he said. Thank you, Tim, she said. Candy's memorial service took place a couple weeks later, and Tim took time off to be there for her parents. According to the autopsies, both Jake and Mike were found to be HIV positive, along with Candy. From what police were able to piece together, Candy told Jake about her diagnosis and said they should get tested. When Jake and Mike learned they were also positive, the older Hudson shot her in the head, then his son, and finally shot himself. Tim spent a few days mourning Candy's death, thinking back over the good years they had together. Then one day, out of the blue, he got a visit from Cynthia Stone, another rep who worked on his team. Hey, cowboy, she said. You want to join us for happy hour tonight? You look like you could use some company. Tim thought about it for just a moment. He almost turned her down, but then had second thoughts. What the hell, he said. I could use some good company right about now. Sure, I'll join you. Well, then, come on down to the hitch and post after work, okay? She asked, smiling. I'll be there, he said. Thanks for the invite. And so, the circle of life continues, he thought as she walked away. Then he heard a familiar female voice in the back of his mind. Go for it, big boy. She's got the hots for you, the voice said. Surprised, he looked around but saw no one. He felt a chill go up his spine for a moment. No, he thought to himself. That isn't possible. Or is it? Dear listener, if you have reached this far please click on the subscribe button. It will be a great help.